I wouldn't be in this role today if I haven't met a leader who dared to kind of think a bit outside the normal profile. I'm not a middle-aged white male. I was probably a pain in the ass for many. But what do you mean by inspirational trip? You know, this is an Excel file. Let, let's look at the KPIs. I think as a leader, you need to create a clear vision and a clear direction. It's important also to have fun. And it's really hard to have fun over Teams or uh, Google Meets. After this session, I'm going to go down to the CrossFit box. The best moment in my whole career, a professional career, is when I... Welcome to Sports and Outdoor Mentors. In this episode, I chat with Sarah Molina, the president and CEO of Peak Performance at their amazing global headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. We chat about life before peak performance, from moving from law to leadership and finding a balance between work, family and sport, plus much, much more. Before we get into this episode, I have one favour to ask. Please hit the subscribe button. This helps us to continue to grow the channel so we can elevate the content and continue to bring you great insights from other sports and outdoor industry leaders. Thanks for your support, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Sarah, so looking back over your your life, actually, not just your career, what are the defining moments that have led you to where you are today as the CEO and president of Peak Performance, but also with a uh, uh, vice chair role with one of the largest uh, football associations in Sweden? So what, what are those defining moments that brought you to, to today? Well, I guess, you know, it's everything that you're exposed to throughout life that kind of forms you to who to who you are. Um, I think I'm a very value driven person. I think that really comes from my mom and dad, from my family. And that's, you know, for me to, to who I am. I also am the youngest. I have a nine year old older brother, which has always been you know, he has always been challenging me. I never wanted to be like the slowest, the, you know, the, so I, I think that has given me a bit of the winning spirit that really has taken me to where, where I am. And then I really like problem solving that kind of triggers me. So I think throughout my professional career, it has really been about like problem solving, not always problems that has, you know, I've had passion in, but always like the winning spirit of solving the problem. Interesting. So that relationship with your older brother, I, that it was like a quite a competitive relationship, would you say? Not for him, I think. Okay. You know, I you know he was so much older than me, so he just no matter what I did, I was probably you know slowing him down or you know. But I really didn't want him to see me like that. So when we were skiing, I always tried to keep his pace. Or but nine years is a lot. If if I was ten, he was nineteen. So yeah, yeah, yeah big difference. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned skiing. I know that at an early age you used to compete in extreme skiing. So. That experience, did that kind of mold and influence you in any way? And what what did you take away from that? Well, free ride skiing or extreme skiing is really about, you know, taking decisions and make your own line down the mountain, being bold, but still not overdo it or take stupid decisions. So I think, yes, it has it has learned me a lot uh, and also both when it comes to like the extreme part and the adrenaline in in that skiing, uh, but also to mature and understand your own capacity. And um, also the other part of, of it and being out in the wild where no one else goes, more or less. It's just you and the nature, which is uh, which I still think is a fantastic combination and also one of the reasons why I kind of ended up at peak performance somehow that connection with nature at an early age has was maybe one of those factors actually as you said that that led you here so other than skiing were you doing other outdoor activities as a as a kid i did play soccer okay. as well yeah ah, okay. uh, yeah and my family has always been out in the nature and uh, you know hiking and um, cross country skiing it's been a big part of 
our lives. Yeah. So before joining Peak Performance, you spent seven years initially as a lawyer, I believe, and then seven years in financial services. So obviously quite a contrast um, to where you find yourself today. What were the best and the worst experiences of that time as a as a lawyer and in the financial services industry? Well, I had during those years, I had a great opportunity. I worked with fantastic people, uh, knowledgeable, and I worked in uh, companies with very like mature structures, uh, processes for everything, more or less. And so I would say I learned a lot, and um, also, you know, during that time we had we had a bank crisis, which was good and bad. I I, I again got to learned a lot about how to handle crisis. Lehman, I was uh, working uh, close to compliance with uh, during the the Lehman crisis, which learned uh, you know it was a <laughs> a really strong experience. Um, so. But, but at the same time, I didn't really have my heart in what I was doing. I was probably not really triggered by the same things as my colleagues when I worked in those industries. It was, um, I, I was always, again, after solving the problem, and that triggered me rather than like the kind of things that you are, you know, striving for in a bank or when you look back on those times and, and the things that you learned what is there anything that stands out that has really helped you or helps you today in your role today sure i mean 14 years in the financial industry and in the, those different roles of course formed me to to a lot to who i am today i think it is um, for me really important to have processes for things. Uh, it's also what I needed to do. I was working uh, in the bank. I was working close to the trading floor. And sometimes you really need to take fast decisions. You don't have all facts, but you need to dare to take the decision anyway. I think that is something that I bring with me. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, you know, it's uh, also about having the right people in the right place uh, to build the knowledge that you need to, to succeed. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that, just touching on that decision making, I can imagine in that environment, as you say, you're really forced to to make decisions quickly. So when you're in those situations today, what's the process you go through from a decision making point of view? You, you're, I'm sure you're taking data on board, but also there's some some gut feelings as well. What what's the balance? Um, yeah, well, how, how do you approach that? Well, first of all, as I'm not, you know, born into this industry, I've been working in this industry now since two, 2016. So I need to be surrounded with people that know their things that are experts within their field to guide me that's super important and i need to be able to also um, get the information from different angles so i can take the decision um, so i think that's the most important part um, for me and then yes sometimes it is a stomach feeling more than more than facts mm. yeah absolutely but then you need to dare to go with that stomach feeling and believe that you know, and if if it's wrong, then then you'll have to fix it afterwards. But I think uh, oftentimes one of the dangers, especially working in a in a you know corporate environment, is that you can be sometimes too slow to take decisions. Yeah. And and I think that ability to take quick decisions and somehow have a like a fast, almost like a fast fail approach to what you're doing, as you said, okay, we all make mistakes. You know, then it's about learning from it. So. Yeah, no, it's uh, getting that balance between gut and and fact and data is uh, yeah is not always easy. So, in addition to your role here, as I already mentioned, so you're I think vice chair for one of the largest uh, football associations in Sweden. So, I'm really interested to know how that came about. You've already maybe hinted to that, saying that you played soccer um, when you were younger, but how did that come about? 
what's what does that entail and and also why do you choose to to give up your time to to do that well as i said i i when i was younger i played soccer and for me the soccer team and being part of that community was really like a safe zone you know it was something else from school it were where you know you had your teammates you were always welcome and um it was a, a you know a belonging where you could where everyone had the same value so to say and i i have two daughters both of them play soccer and i've also you know seen a bit of how the development in in especially in sweden then has become you know a bit rougher the whole society is getting more more and more demanding and rougher and i do believe that sport has a very big role to play for our kids and teenagers to you know help help them feel that they have this community and safe zone where they they are welcome where everyone is included and uh, what made me uh, engage is that i also see that you know we have been leaning against getting more uh, searching for young talents and um, seeing that exclusion rather than inclusion and uh, that is for me you know contradictional to what i think sports and a soccer team should be so so that's the reason why i decided to take on the role as uh, vice chairman okay great and so um, um in that role what what does that entail what are you just on a high level i'm just interested to understand well well it is uh, what we've done recently is to look into what does this specific association stand for what are the values that we should uh, or never you know compromise with and how do we secure um, that that is also lived in all teams and by by everyone and um, supporting also the staff uh, in like some of the some of the issues and and topics that they face in their everyday challenges Um, however we're we're quite a big board and everyone is very engaged so i would say it's it's a team doing it and um, that's also why it makes works for me so you're you're married as you already mentioned you've got two uh two daughters two senior leadership roles in the industry so finding a a balance between professional and personal must be must be tough so are there any do you have any non-negotiables or any rules that you set yourself that okay this is important for me and you know you know i won't compromise on this to make sure that i i maintain a, a good balance well i do never compromise on my children and uh, with that said that's uh, truth with modifications of course because i when they really need me I was going to say uh, children can think that they need you a lot <laughs> but uh, when when they truly need me I'm there for them no matter where I am um, if it is in the middle of the night and I'm on the other side of the world I pick up the phone I have a FaceTime call or or whatever is needed but I'm not alone in it you know I have I have also there um, they have a great father uh, we have a team around them with my mother my husband's mother so uh, but that is I always want to be there for them and I set off time to be there for homework and um, you know seeing them I don't cook a lot that you know I that that's uh, uh, maybe my my weak spot where, where I where I don't have really the time to do so but um, no I never compromise when when they truly need me I want to be there for them it must not be easy though because I'm sure that you know with your roles your responsibilities you know there's there's always something to do there's probably always somebody somewhere in the world that that wants to speak to you so how do you manage that balance is there is there a way or an approach that you that you that you have to really work on this I'm super disciplined that's you know I when at work I work and when I off I offset I, I I lock time in my calendar for when I'm home and being present. I think it's super important to not mix up 
uh, those different parts of your life. Sometimes, yes, it's it's not doable. But then I'm also clear to my family and say, I now need to go and take this meeting. I know it's middle of dinner time, but I'll be back in 50 minutes or whatever it takes. But not like not working and having dinner at the same time, really being disciplined to when I'm when I'm there, I'm also mentally present. I think that's um, that's the key. And where did that discipline come from? Was that from your your legal um, uh, education or even before that? Where, where did that come from? I don't know. I think partly, yes. Uh, but I think it was it, it has become, you know, a, a method of for survival in when it's really hectical and you really you need to I think you will not find peace in any of the different roles that everyone has in their life if you don't separate them. If you mix everything up, you will um, you lose your inner compass. So for me, it's it's a way of like really making sure that I do I do what I can in the zone that I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish I was <laughs> able to say I was as su- su- successful as that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the industry. And one of the things that I know you've talked about in the past and you're passionate about is diversity in, in leadership. And particularly when we look at our industry, you know, a lot, most senior leadership roles are filled by white middle-aged men. Um, I know that for you, finding that balance, that um, that diversity is important. So I guess one, what's your approach to that here at Peak? But also, how can we, how should we address this as an industry? Because I think personally on my side, where I am today working from a recruitment point of view, it's something that I'm always encouraging my clients to address but there is oftentimes real reluctance to do that. And so, yeah, I'm really interested to, to get your point of view on this. Well, first of all, I don't really, I mean, I think it's super important with diversity. It's the mix of people that sets uh, a good team. Uh, so my focus is always to try and get the right competences in the right place and also trying to get different dimensions into a team. But I do think here at Peak Performance, we have a quite equal gender split, actually a bit more female than men overall in the company. So do I have in my lead team, but it's nothing that I'd actively, you know, um, it's just maybe it is because I'm I'm not a middle-aged white male that I get get those type of profile also um, that are you know curious about the brand and the company uh, so um, it's actually I, I'm more focused on making sure that I have the different dimensions and um, I think on the global expansion journey which we are as a brand it's also super important going forward what we we are quite nordic in our um organization today so right now it's more about getting the global competences in industry perspective is there something that you think that we we that we should focus on that we should do a better job to address this this issue is there something that kind of stands out in your mind yeah i mean I wouldn't be in this role today if I haven't met leader who dared to kind of think a bit outside the normal profile and uh, believed in me. And I think that's probably think something that I would give us one aspect to dare to see that the different competence is uh, not the threat it's rather a strength and um, I sometimes think it's easier to go with you know the usual profile or someone has been in the industry or knows a lot already but to have that other dimension can actually lead 
to a larger development and larger opportunity than going with some of the safeguards. So I think it, it requires a bit of boldness to believe in and see other things than uh, the stereotype that is often maybe the easiest way. What's your point of view around recruiting from outside of the industry? Because again, I speak to people that are always very reluctant to do that. But I, I think uh, to your point, you know, a good balance is important. So you're 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 open to to bringing people in that are coming from outside of the industry. Yeah, I mean that's how I came in. So it would it would be a bit weird if I said no. And I think you know when I joined Peak Performance, coming from a totally different industry, yes, I needed some calibration. Uh, I came from a hundred and fifty year old bank into a brand with you know a creative part uh, and a totally different business model i started also i was probably a pain in the ass for many because i didn't you know what do in, what, what do you mean by inspirational trip you know this is an excel file let let's look at the kpis uh, so so i needed to calibrate uh, but it it was also a great journey for me, which I haven't regretted at all, ever. Uh, but also the way I needed to question things to understand the business. I think that was super healthy for the business because I needed to understand. And there were there was, for me, no kind of set way of how you needed to do things. So why do we actually do it like this? Why does the business case on on a store opening, you know, why doesn't that, and you know, it doesn't tell me the actual numbers here. I don't understand it. Can you please explain? So I think that, you, you, um, of course, you can't have like, you know, a full organization with, with people who have no clue on how things sh- should be done. But I think it's healthy to have those questions um, asked every now and then in different parts of the organization. So what do you consider to be your most important task as a leader? I think as a leader, you need to create a clear vision and a clear direction so that everyone knows, you know, where we're going and why. And then, of course, they need the tools to be able to get there. And... um, We spoke a bit about culture. Uh, I think also as a leader to enable, I cannot, I cannot as a leader set the culture. Uh, That's to up to everyone. But I do think to nurse and make sure the culture is there to motivate and engage people. And also facilitate, uh, you know, life balance and um, well-being and having having fun at work. Yeah. What's the task that you find the most difficult to do? And, and is there a way that, because at the end of the day, there are always things that, you know, we're not good at. And probably they're the things that we put off to, to the last minute in some cases. But is there a, that thing that you don't like doing or you consider yourself not good at? How do you approach actually doing it, knowing that you you ultimately have to? Over the years, I think I've learned to, first of all, you know, sleep on those things a bit. I I used to, when I was younger, I was really like, you know, reacting very, very quickly and, you know, taking it. Now I need some time and I need to, you know, think it through, maybe bounce it with someone and... um, make sure I often make things bigger in my head than they actually are. So it's about like taking them for what they really are and and um, um, making sure I put the right emphasis into it. And uh, so I think that that's a great learning. Don't don't act immediately. Give it some time and reflect and bounce it with someone. What I really don't like, I as I mentioned, I like to have people around me that more or less knows everything better than me. <laughs> so and and I need to have also people around me that I trust. And I guess 
what I don't like is to be into the details. But if I do see that, you know, what is agreed is not happening and that is something going back, uh, remind, ask for details, that is something that really drains me and annoys me, which I don't like. You've mentioned several times the importance of those, I guess, your leadership team, the people around you. When you're looking to add people to that team, is there something or what's the most important thing that you're looking for when you're maybe outside of kind of skills? Because, of course, that varies depending on the position. But is there something that you're really looking for when you're hiring people like that? that are going to sit in your team that, as you said, you need to trust? and. I mean, again, it, it is a lot about the values, uh, making sure that we share the same values and also that you are a fit into our culture at Peak Performance. We have a very strong culture and I think it's hard to like to be here if you don't like the culture. So it's it's not, you know, it, it goes both way. It's hard to succeed in the role and it's also probably not good for, for the person to jump into a culture if you're not a culture fit and, and share the values. How do you get a feeling of whether they do fit with the culture? Because that's, as we, as we talked about, it's super difficult. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it is to spend time and find ways to get beyond the corporate answers and spend time with the candidate, uh, you know, go for a walk, have, um, you know, maybe a training session together or um, discuss other things than work. What do they think about, you know, <laughs> uh, soccer and soccer teams and whatever it might be that you can get, you know, put the person into another context and also get to know them. But it takes a bit of time. But uh, recruiting and getting the right people in the right place and uh, the right fit, it is tricky and it, it requires time. Can you share your perspective of, of how a company culture can ultimately determine or, or, or be a big part of the success of a company, of a business? The first time I got exposed to really strong culture was actually when I started at Peak Performance. Um, and um, culture tied to values. The, the value words for Peak Performance is passion, togetherhood, responsibility, and winning spirit. And I, have, I, don't, I haven't met anyone within our organization who doesn't have a true passion for this brand. And I think, you know, when you go through hard times, uh, to have everyone caring about what they do and act as a team and wanting to do the best for the brand, um, that is a super strength. How do you maintain that, that culture uh, as the business grows I, and as you become more and more international, more and more global? I assume that is more and more difficult to, to maintain that culture. So what's the approach that you have here to try and maintain that? Yeah, no, that's actually something that we are discussing and reflecting a lot about because it's one thing to have a strong culture in your HQ, uh, you know, where people are together all the time. But then you're, we're now expanding in North America, in Asia. Everyone within the brand needs to be an ambassador and needs to contribute. And we really need to make sure that you also onboard everyone into the culture. So it is um, hard for someone who's never been to Sweden, never been at HQ to understand the feeling you actually get when you enter this building uh, at Peak Performance. So it's the onboarding to get everyone here, make sure that they understand what this brand is all about, how we treat each other. And the next step is, of course, to also include our consumers in this culture and make sure that you know every interaction with this brand you get the same feeling of being part of this tribe who wants to stand for our values and our culture so that's even going uh, the next level beyond to the consumer so so i assume then the the 
the messaging and that you're doing through retail then is very much tied around that uh, that culture and values. And how you you know how you meet the customer in stores on online and um, honestly, I think. This is nothing I have created or have been created recently at Peak Performance. Uh, this brand was founded by skiers wanting to do what no one else had done. And already from the beginning, when the brand was founded, there was this community and uh, true tribe around the brand. So it is for us that are you know here and now and for the future those coming after us to really nurse that and make sure that because it's such an important part of the dna of the brand yeah. as an outsider my perception of the brand has always been that you know you're very committed to you know employee well-being etc so how does that that culture help maintain a a healthy work environment and healthy workplace for your team and and what strategies do you do you put in place to to really ensure that that's that's it's really lived you know because i think a lot of a lot of businesses tend to put these statements on the wall but then when you talk to people in the business there's a disconnect between the reality so I, how do you really bring these things to life? Well, I mean, there are those kind of, I would say, easy things because that's how I see the, that part is to really make sure that everyone coming back to, you know, everyone having that passion for the brand, make sure that we also live our brand. Uh, we have training sessions. I think it's now like, you know, um, five times a week in the building. We have yoga sessions, running sessions, CrossFit sessions that everyone can participate in, in like uh, during the work week, but also making sure that we live our brand for the activities we stand for. You know, it might be that um, the team goes skiing or goes hiking and make sure that we set off time for everyone to live the brand. Uh, and I think that's that's one part of it. But the other part is also kind of making sure that we have an individual leader ship in in the sense that you see each individual and um, everyone has different needs and I think that's also one part of making making a life balance for our employees how can we meet them where they need us maybe they will perform better if we help them with or give them the opportunity to so um, all those as aspects I think is important and are you able to um, to uh, to take advantage of those great uh, the great uh, benefits that you talked about earlier on the the different training sessions okay. etc. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, after after this session, I'm going to go down to the CrossFit box. So Perfect. yeah, <laughs> right. uh, but I think that's it's really important because at the end of the day, you set the tone. So I think if people see that you doing that, then they're going to feel, okay, well, actually, yeah, this is something that, you know, Sara is, uh, is doing so great. You know, that means, you know, I can. So. No, I really try to be part of the organization. We eat together, we train together. And uh, it's so important for me to know everyone's names and, you know, remember a bit like, oh, yeah, she did. She she just came back from maternity leave and she, you know, she did that course of doing that and she was traveling there and or he just came back from his um, um, you know, bike competition and uh, those things to try and remember and be part of and make, be a human also and not always be just, you know, the CEO that uh, lives its own life. Yeah, in the ivory tower. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's great. So over the last, well, it seems like a long time now, several years, I think the world has moved from almost from, crisis to crisis, which then leads to other crises in some cases. So do you have examples of how the culture and the values of the company have actually enabled you to, to navigate through those crises? Yeah, I think COVID was one of those um, crises when we had to lean against our culture. 
It was tough. We had uh, reduced wa- working schedule. We also had to let people go, uh, the cost saving aspects. And um, it, it was really a tough, tough time for everyone. Uh, and uh, just by, you know, seeing how everyone really, you know, stepped up and uh, again back to this like the passion and the winning spirit and taking the responsibility and uh, that that was impressive i'm impressed about how the organization really took that on and uh, then of course being also not seeing each other and not interacting i think it it's, it was needed to be able to interact again and to start, you know, loading yourself with each other and, and the, the interaction you get in a physical meeting. But through that time, we could really rely on on our culture and our values, which was fantastic. One of the things coming out of COVID, of course, is the, the work from home um, trend, let's, let's say, uh, What's been your approach to this and and have you found it more difficult to retain that culture and uh, and live by the values when people are more dispersed? Yes and no. I think um, we saw that it was, you know, starting to be, I started to get a bit worried, but also as soon as it has opened up, we also see that people want to be here and um, we give the opportunity to our employees to partly work from home because I think that's important coming back to the individual leadership and making sure that everyone has the opportunity to you know pick up their kids every now and then really early or whatever you need to have that life balance Um, but I would say that we do see that the mix of being present and have the interaction with your colleagues and also being able to you know sit at home get things done and um, that that is for us working very well I guess anyway the it's the same challenge when you're international anyway yeah. you know to to transmit those values and that culture whether people are working in a department 100 meters away or working you know thousands of miles away it's the it's the same challenge ultimately it is and uh, i think as i said in the beginning it's important also to have fun you know and it's really hard to have fun over teams or uh, google meets it's um it's not that fun to meet someone there. It's much more fun to, you know, have lunch together or train together or sit in a physical meeting arguing than waiting for the other one to pause so that you, you know, or someone gets thrown out of the meeting in the middle of a discussion. There's still a long way to go with the technology because you said all those things still happen. It's uh, not quite there yet. If you knew you weren't going to fail, would you do anything differently? There are always things that you realize you could have done differently. But I do think that unknown and the risk of not, you know, doing it the right way is kind of also part of the of the challenge. And if if you would know to 100 percent that it wouldn't fail, I don't think it would be super exciting. It would be rather boring. If you look back over your career, is there, what do you consider to be, I mean, I'm not sure people think about it like this, but what's a big failure that you've had that that was tough for you to manage at the time? And how did you personally manage that? And and what came out of it on the positive side? Well, there are there are circumstances where I do have, where I feel that I have compromised with my values um, in situations where I felt like, okay, I'm probably not, my values are not probably fully behind me right now. Um, and it's a balance. How do, you, how do you treat those situations and what are the consequences of not, not going through with a decision or, or what, it, what it can be? And um, those are the tough moments, really. Um, and you learn a lot and looking backwards you might have said like maybe it wasn't worth it uh 
but at that time, knowing what you knew then, that's the decision you took. And I think also one thing um, that I try to, you know, to to regret something you've done and spend time of on something you can't really undo is kind of making another mistake because you can't solve it that way anyway. What do you struggle with? What's What do you find um, either professionally or outside of professional life? Yeah, what, what do you find difficult? Time. Time. I need more time. Yeah. And that's my biggest struggle. Yes, I'm saying like I'm super disciplined and, but, but you know, it, um, I, uh, I need to uh, also very much prioritize um, things. What, what can I delegate and what, but if I had more time, I could do everything a bit better. Yeah, time is the, the, uh, the one resource that we, we can't, money doesn't buy. <laughs> no way to get more time, unfortunately. Have you ever worked with or had the support of a coach or a mentor that you've, you've kind of personally kind of targeted to say, okay, yeah, you know, I want to work with somebody to help me? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I, I still work with her and she's, I would say she's both a professional coach in my like professional life but at the same time also for me as a person and in my private life she's she has become a mixture you know if I have if I have a tough argue with my husband I call her and cry you know but but and also if I have a tough meeting with our owners uh, I can also like you know get her to put it in perspective and how do we do it better next time and uh, and so yeah I I haven't always had that and uh, it took some time to find a person that I felt I really wanted to open up to and that I could trust and that I also felt like you know worth investing again the time to spend time with and and um how did you find that person I'm interested because one of the I get a lot of questions about, you know, how do you find uh, coaches and mentors? Um, was it somebody with it was recommended for you or did you kind of actively kind of search? And it sounds like maybe you've been, you tried with a few people and have obviously found somebody now that, that works for you. Yeah, I, those that I've tried earlier has been those that, you know, they have done something for the team and you kind of were you know given them as as a support or I didn't choose them myself and um, I think it's really important and and this one that I'm now you know we we don't see each other that often it has been according to you know I don't really have the time so uh, but uh, she just you know stumbled uh, in in my way we were doing another thing I really liked her and we were doing a team thing together and um, um, we had we had a couple of sessions together and it 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 all felt very good and natural uh, to talk to her about things and um so I think it is really about finding that right person who also dares to challenge you. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, somebody that yeah isn't afraid to say whatever they think. And, and also said, doesn't challenge. have like an ag- agenda mm. of their own. Yeah. It's not, you know, um, her true ag- agenda is to help me. Yes, yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's, that's great advice. What type of leader are you if you had to describe your your approach to leadership how would you do that oh first of all i think it is um, probably not for me to describe what type of a leader a leader is how you are perceived and um, so i guess i just have to say what type of leader i would like to be perceived as and um, I, I, I want to be tr- transparent, as transparent as I can be in this role. I want to be also direct, clear and, and uh, fair. I, I want to be humble because I don't know everything. At the same time, I want to also be bold and taking those hard decisions when needed. So a combination of humble and bold, I think that that's how I would like to be perceived as a leader. 
how have you seen your approach and your style of leadership evolve over your career? I think the the decision taking has improved. Um, and also when I entered this role, I had more or less my old team members becoming my direct reports. So so it was also a bit hard for me to find my my leadership against my my team members. Um, but I think I have become much more secure in my role and um, also a bit more self-confidence, which I think you need you need to believe in yourself. You need to believe in your stomach feeling and and dare to trust it, which is something that matures over time, of course. What's your favorite piece of sports or outdoor gear? And you're not allowed to say something from peak performance. That's too I'm easy. Not. That's I'm too not. easy. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> because you, you know, you must have other gear that isn't peak yeah, performance. Yeah. No, but I would say that's my skis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, I have a few. I would imagine. Uh, but um, depending on condition and uh, you know feeling uh, the weight of your skis on your shoulder on your way to to the the, um, the gondola or yeah. that's a fantastic feeling yeah mm. are you still doing some free ride skiing now i try as much as yeah. i i can i uh, the best the best moment in my whole career a professional career is when i got the opportunity to actually uh, do the female run in the finals of Free Ride World Tour in Verbier a couple of years ago. Wow. So that was on my bucket list and um, it was super fun. I would imagine. So I try to always, you know, also live the brand and uh, ski with the team and um, be out there, yeah. test our, our things. That sounds amazing. I mean, already Verbier is a great place to ski, but yeah, to do that, that's... Uh, as you said, a nice one to tick off the list. So what's, what book or podcast or, um, I don't know, video or TV show would you recommend for somebody that is working the industry to maybe inspire them or give them some drive and energy? I, I recently read Legacy uh, by James Kerr. It is uh, about leadership. It's a leadership book. Uh, um, from All Blacks, the rug, the New Zealand rugby team, yeah. and uh, that's that's a book I really would recommend. Uh, it's about culture. It's about asking why yeah. uh, in both good and bad times, and uh, not being afraid of like really doing the dirty work. Yeah. And um, so that's that's a great great leadership book that okay. I would recommend. What's the most valuable piece of advice you've ever received? To not get stuck. Okay. You know, um, don't spend time things. Uh, thing, don't spend time on things you can't change, and uh, make the best of the situation. And you know, just keep going forward and don't get stuck. Yeah, that's good advice. Not always easy, no. but uh, and was that was that advice you received early in your life, or was it something recently? Or I think my mother is saying it to me probably once a week. Oh, yeah, you know, and and she, she's she and and there is probably a reason why she's saying it as well, because I I I I have a tendency to you know want to solve everything or how can I you know find a solution to this but uh, sometimes you just need to move on and um, get prioritized to focus on the things that you actually can solve and that will have the largest impact what a brilliant piece of advice from your mum that's uh, <laughs> and also great that it comes from your mum as well somehow it's it's even more valuable i don't know that's my perception anyway but uh oh, that's great that's really good if today was the last day in your role here in peak mm. what message would you give to your team i have a fantastic team they know what needs to be done 
I would probably say follow your instincts and stand up for what you believe is right. And if you could give future leaders in the sports and outdoor industry three pieces of advice, what would they be? One would probably be don't get stuck. And the second one, dare to challenge the you know usual way of doing things. Always ask why. And the third thing would be believe in people and their differences. So as you know, this podcast aims to help people on their career path within the sports and the outdoor industry. So is there anything that we should have covered today that we haven't or anything that I should have asked? No, I think this industry is really filled with people with passion for the industry. And um, I think that's really rare um, coming from coming from from the outside from a different industry passion for for uh, what we do and what we stand for and i think that's also something the whole industry needs to acknowledge and um, it's a great opportunity for the whole industry going forward that we have so many passionate people absolutely absolutely i think that's the that's the uh, the one thing that holds us I think somehow all together you know of course different people in different businesses have different priorities and different values and different cultures but I would say generally speaking it's yeah that passion for for the outdoors for sport for activity that really holds us together so Oh, that's great. Well, thank you very much for your time, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me here to Stockholm to your beautiful offices. I'm very jealous <laughs> walking around. It's been really good to talk to you. I think there's been lots of really interesting and useful pieces of advice for people there. So thank you very much. And, thank you uh, it's for been having great me. Chat. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. We love to read your feedback. So please leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks again for your support. See you soon and don't forget to subscribe.